Hi everyone, this is Miss Lassar, and today I'm going to be talking to you about air pollution. Here's our flow. I'll talk to you about why we care about air pollution. We'll learn about primary air pollutants, secondary air pollutants, thermal inversions, acid deposition, lead, and improving air quality here in the United States. So first, why do we care about air pollution? Well, if I asked you which of these kills the most Americans each year, you might be tempted to answer car accidents or homicides or potentially drugs and alcohol or infectious diseases like the flu and pneumonia. And this is out of the context of a pandemic. This is pre-COVID numbers. Uh, but you would be wrong because fine particles kill more Americans each year than all of these other things. An estimated 64,000 Americans die each year uh, because of fine particle pollution and the diseases that are associated with this. The average adult breathes over 3,000 gallons of air every day. What we breathe in really matters. Children breathe even more air per pound of body weight, and so they're more susceptible to air pollution. And we look when we look at the health effects of breathing in polluted air, we're going to see larger impacts and more harmful impacts on children. The elderly are also more sensitive to air pollution because they often have heart or lung disease. And what you breathe in impacts your lungs directly and your heart indirectly. And so that can exacerbate some pre-existing conditions. Some of the diseases caused by air pollution, and these include diseases that are caused directly and indirectly by air pollution, include heart disease, stroke, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, lung cancer and other cancers like leukemia or mesothelioma, coronary artery disease, asthma, birth defects, immune system defects, neurological problems and developmental delays, and premature death. And there's about 7 million premature deaths because of air pollution worldwide each year. So a quick reminder of like the anatomy of our lungs, these are the alveoli, which are the main uh, oxygen absorbing parts of your lung. This is where air moves into after you breathe it in. By the way, these are really small. There's like 6 million of these alveoli uh, in your lungs. So you have many, many small bulbs like this and they expand when you breathe air in. And oxygen from the air you breathe in diffuses into the capillaries that are around each alveolus. And then carbon dioxide diffuses out of those capillaries into the alveolus. And then you breathe that carbon dioxide out when you exhale. And so this is a normal healthy alveolus and bronchiole connection. And here's our, our diseased one. Um, our al alveolus is clogged and so it will not be able to absorb and move oxygen into the bloodstream as easily. It won't be able to remove carbon dioxide as easily. The bronchial, this tube is inflamed and you can see that the hole is narrowed. And so we might be getting less air in there in the first place and moving less air out. And so these are some of the structural changes that can result from air pollution. And then when we're thinking about cardiovascular heart impacts, well, what's moving this blood around your body? What's pumping this blood around your body? Your heart, uh, and it's pumping it through veins and arteries and capillaries. And so if we are damaging these structures, we're gonna make our heart work harder. It's gonna have to pump blood more quickly uh, and we might eventually do damage to the heart, et cetera. And so those are some of the direct diseases caused by air pollution, heart disease, stroke from weakened blood vessels or overstressed blood vessels, COPD, uh, lung cancer and immune system defects, neurological problems. These are gonna be caused by other toxic particles in the air, carcinogens that can cause cancer, um, immune system defects from breathing in endocrine disruptors and neurological problems from breathing in toxic particles like lead or mercury. Okay, so when we're thinking about air pollution, we got to understand where it is and how the atmosphere is set up. And here's a nice diagram to show how the atmosphere is divided into layers. The first layer and most important layer for us is the troposphere. And this is the lowest layer of the atmosphere. This only goes about 20 kilometers, 12 miles up. And this includes most of the air we breathe and the air that's involved in weather and climate. Most of our climate patterns, even those large climate circulation patterns are happening down here in the troposphere and a little bit into the stratosphere. 
the troposphere, again, the air we breathe, is mostly made up of nitrogen. It's 78% nitrogen, 21% oxygen. And so when I say nitrogen, I'm referring to nitrogen gas, that's N2. And when I say oxygen, I'm also referring to oxygen gas, O2, not just nitrogen atoms and oxygen atoms. These are nitrogen and oxygen molecules. And if you added these up, this actually is 99% of the air, so that leaves 1% of the air left over for everything else, including things like water vapor, carbon dioxide, methane, ozone, nitrous oxide, all the other pollutants that we'll talk about today. The second layer of the atmosphere that is important to us is the ozone layer. So this isn't an official layer of the atmosphere. It's in between the stratosphere and troposphere. And it is a thick accumulation of ozone particles, O3. And this layer is particularly important because it prevents about 95% of incoming UV radiation from reaching ground level. That ra UV radiation, you know, is the thing that can cause a sunburn. And if you can get a sunburn just from being outside in the 5% of UV radiation, radiation that's currently hitting the ground, think about what it would be like if 95% more UV radiation entered uh, and hit us down here at ground level. There are other important level layers of the atmosphere, like the stratosphere, mesosphere, and thermosphere, um, but we are not going to be discussing them in the context of air pollution. So what's in the air? How does it get there? Uh, I'm going to divide this into two types of pollutants. The first type of pollutant is a primary pollutant. And this is a pollutant that is directly released from the pollution source. For example, we've got a smokestack here, an industrial smokestack. We can see the water vapor coming out. We can infer there's maybe some carbon dioxide coming out. And those are things that are produced from maybe combustion inside the factory and are directly released into the atmosphere. On the other hand, we have another type of pollutant secondary pollutants. And these are new chemicals made in the atmosphere when primary pollutants and atmospheric gases combine. So the key thing to know is that nobody is dumping or shooting a bunch of sulfuric acid into the atmosphere, but we still have a bunch of sulfuric acid in the atmosphere. How's that possible? Well, if we take a primary pollutant like sulfur dioxide, and it combines with oxygen and water that's in the atmosphere, those will recombine to form this new molecule, sulfuric acid, which is a pollutant, and it's a secondary pollutant. We're not directly emitting it into the atmosphere, but it's formed from combinations of primary pollutants and atmospheric gases. So I'm going to tell you about the main uh, primary and secondary pollutants. For each pollutant, you will need to know whether it's a primary or secondary pollutant, its chemical name, so the full written out name like water vapor, its chemical formula, so H2O would be the example here, how it's formed and how it's released into the environment, what effect it has on the environment, and what effect it has on human health. You can choose to set this up like a chart. You could make a five column chart where you just note each of these for each pollutant that we go through, or you could write this out kind of paragraph style, up to you. Here are our primary pollutants. The first one is carbon dioxide. That's its chemical name. Uh, it's abbreviated CO2, which means it's made of one carbon atom and two oxygen atoms, and is a primary pollutant. How is carbon dioxide formed? All combustion. So all combustion has the same uh, general formula. We take a hydrocarbon like methane from natural gas or like the hydrocarbons in oil. We burn it in the presence of oxygen and it can only burn in the presence of oxygen. And the hydrogen and carbon atoms from the hydrocarbon will combine with the oxygen atoms from this oxygen molecule to form water vapor and carbon dioxide. What are the impacts of carbon dioxide? You know this already. Carbon dioxide is a greenhouse gas. Although it's relatively weak, it is very plentiful. Our second type of pollutant is carbon monoxide, abbreviated CO, one carbon atom, one oxygen atom, still a primary pollutant. And it's formed through incomplete combustion. So a complete combustion reaction is one where every single atom from the hydrocarbon that's burned uh, combines perfectly with the oxygen atoms to form carbon dioxide and water and nothing's left over. However, 
almost no combustion happens that perfectly. In most combustion reactions, uh, some of the carbon atoms are going to combine with oxygen atoms to make carbon monoxide instead. We see incomplete combustion in almost all combustion reactions. The key ones that happen in large scale on Earth include burning biomass, burning fossil fuels, think about in a power plant, and motor vehicle engines. So that's still burning a fossil fuel, burning gasoline, which is a petroleum product um, in an engine. Internal combustion engines, power plant combustion reactions, and burning biomass are all very incomplete combustion reactions. So we're going to generate a lot of carbon monoxide. In terms of impacts, it's not a greenhouse gas, uh, but it does have a human health effect. If we have a large accumulation of carbon monoxide, uh, it can kill you. Carbon monoxide can actually mimic oxygen and it can bind to red blood cells instead of oxygen binding to red blood cells, which deprives the body of oxygen and can lead to people suffocating. This is an issue if we have a large buildup of carbon monoxide like we would have in a small or enclosed space. So you may have heard that it's a really bad idea to leave the engine of your car running inside the garage. This is why that motor vehicle combustion produces a lot of carbon dioxide because of its incomplete combustion, that carbon monoxide can build up and can lead to carbon monoxide poisoning. Our third pollutant is sulfur dioxide, abbreviated SO2, and it's a primary pollutant. It's formed in combustion reactions where there's some sulfur present. So hydrocarbons have hydrogen and carbon, but many hydrocarbons, like the hydrocarbons in coal and oil, have some sulfur atoms in there too. Coal burning, especially high sulfur coal, can release a lot of sulfur dioxide. Smelting in volcanoes also release a lot of sulfur dioxide. In terms of impacts, its main human health impact is that it's a strong respiratory irritant. That means if you breathe in sulfur dioxide, it will hurt. It will feel scratchy at first in high concentrations. It might feel burny. It can cause major lung damage if it's inhaled in high enough concentrations. Environmentally, sulfur dioxide is a main ingredient for both acid rain formation and industrial smog. So these are kind of implying some sex secondary pollutant uh, formation. Acid rain and industrial smog will both be formed as a secondary pollutant, but a key ingredient is this primary pollutant, sulfur dioxide. Our fourth pollutant are the nitrogen oxides, and these actually have a couple different chemical formulas. NO and NO2 are both in the category of nitrogen oxides, com combining a nitrogen atom and some number of oxygen atoms. They are formed through vehicle combustion and especially in diesel uh, vehicles and also from burning coal. And the reason for this is because even though there's not a lot of nitrogen in the gasoline in engines, there's a lot of nitrogen in air. And when gasoline is burned inside a car, it's burned in the presence of air. And there's a lot of nitrogen gas in air. Uh, and some of that nitrogen gas ends up being converted and combined with oxygen in the air and turned into these nitrogen oxides. In terms of impacts, nitrogen oxides are also respiratory irritants. So just like uh, sulfur dioxide, they can cause lung irritation. Uh, Long-term exposure to nitrogen oxides can cause chronic lung disease like COPD and asthma. Environmentally, this is similar to sulfur dioxide, nitrogen oxides are a main ingredient in acid rain formation and a main ingredient in photochemical smog. Notice that on the sulfur dioxide slide, I said this was a main ingredient in industrial smog. Nitrogen oxides are a main ingredient in photochemical smog. You will learn later on in this lecture that those are two different things. Our fifth pollutant is suspended particles or particulate matter. And I don't have a chemical formula or a chemical name because there's many different types of suspended particles. And I'll show you some more examples, but they include things like ash, soot, lead, mercury, dust, et cetera. These are all suspended particles that are light enough and small enough to float through the air. And you already learned about this briefly in class, but there's two different sizes of suspended particles that we care about. 
PM10, which is 10 micrometers and smaller. These are particles that are small enough to get stuck in your lungs and block oxygen flow. You actually have a really good clearing mechanism to keep particles out of your lungs. You have little tiny cilia, um, which are little hair-like projections lining your airways. And when you breathe in large particles of dust, the cilia will brush them up and brush them out. And you might feel a little bit of a need to cough to push those particles out of your lungs. Uh, but these PM10 particles and smaller, they're so small that the cilia can't even brush them out. So they get stuck and they accumulate in your alveoli and they can block oxygen flow. PM2.5, which are 2.5 micrometers and smaller, are small enough that they can get stuck in your lungs, but also they can cross over into those capillaries they can move into your bloodstream. And that means that if it's a toxic particle, it's not just gonna clog your lungs, it could also have some impacts on the rest of your body functioning. Suspended particles are formed and released in a variety of ways. Uh, combustion, so all combustion will release some suspended particles. Coal combustion is especially responsible for suspended particle release. Dust, so think about at a construction site or when there's uncovered soil, uh, a vehicle driving along a dirt road, that's gonna kick up a lot of dust into the air. Blasting in mining, think about mountaintop removal and the large scale uh, dynamite that's used to blow off the top of a mountain. Picture all of the dust that's thrown into the air. Our impacts are primarily human health impacts. And as we've been mentioning, uh, this can cause respiratory problems, chronic lung disease, asthma, black lung. So black, one, black lung is an important one to note um, and to be able to reference later. This is a, a lung disease specifically caused by coal dust inhalation. Miners working in underground coal mines are particularly at risk for developing black lung disease because coal particles can build up and accumulate in their lung tissue. Coal is black, which is why it's called black lung disease. And like all particulate matter buildup, this can cause major respiratory problems. And like I mentioned before, some specific particles that are toxic can also cause poisoning. Lead and mercury are key among these. Environmentally, uh, if there's a ton of suspended particle pollution, that will cause a visible haze. Light will not be able to move through those suspended particles. Uh, it could even block photosynthesis if there's enough, if there's enough dust and ash in the air. This is a nice little chart um, showing suspended particle types by size. Notice, okay, here's 10 microns or 10 micrometers. So below this line, anything that exists in size is below this line can get stuck in your lungs. 2.5 micrometers is right about here. Anything that exists at this size or smaller can get stuck in your lungs and can move into your bloodstream. So just take a moment, pause the video and notice what is in each particle category. Our sixth pollutant is called volatile organic compounds. And this is another category. So I don't have a specific chemical formula for you, but these are abbreviated VOCs. And this is a primary pollutant. You release it directly. Uh, VOCs are hydrocarbons, usually, um, sometimes combinations of hydrogen, carbon, and a couple oxygen atoms as well. And they come in a variety of shapes and sizes, and they're released from a variety of sources. Uh, the primary way you might have heard about them before is in paint. Uh, you might have purchased or seen low VOC paint. That's paint that doesn't smell bad. There are some paints, you might have experienced this with things like paint markers or Sharpie markers, uh, where you can really smell a kind of chemically scent coming off of it, what you're smelling are the volatile organic compounds that are released, and they are not good for you. They're also released from landfills, feedlots, and dams. In particular, methane is considered a volatile organic compound. It's just one of these hydrocarbons that can readily turn into a gas and diffuse through the atmosphere. We also know that methane will be released at gas wells. Oil and gas wells will release a variety of hydrocarbons. Vehicle combustion is done by burning hydrocarbons, and sometimes the hydrocarbons don't burn completely, and so they're released out the tailpipe. Interestingly, some tree and plant species will naturally excrete a bunch of different hydrocarbons, and that can actually impact uh, smog formation in some cities. Speaking of impacts, uh, mostly VOCs have human health impacts. 
acute health effects, like you breathe in one of these things and you feel very lightheaded and dizzy, you might even pass out. Some of them are carcinogenic and can cause cancer. One in particular called benzene, B-E-N-Z-E-N-E. -E -E. Benzene is a VOC that's known to be carcinogenic. And they can cause some, something called sick building syndrome, which is something that people who spend a lot of time indoors, that's most of us, might experience. There are some things around us inside our houses that are emitting VOCs at a low level on a regular basis, and that can be responsible for sick building syndrome, where you feel ill when you are indoors in a particular building. In terms of environmental effects, many VOCs are greenhouse gases. Methane is a notorious greenhouse gas and is a more potent greenhouse gas. It can trap more heat than carbon dioxide. Our seventh pollutant is nitrous oxide. So be careful. This is N2O. You already learned about the nitrogen oxides. Those are NO2 and NO. Don't get these confused because they're formed in very different ways and they have very different impacts. Nitrous oxide is formed and released from fertilizers, from manure, and sometimes from fossil fuel combustion. What's actually happening is in the manure itself and in the soil where fertilizers are used, some of the ammonia molecules that are in there get converted into nitrous oxide molecules and diffuse into the atmosphere. Its impacts are primarily environmental. Nitrous oxide is 300 times more potent as a greenhouse gas than carbon dioxide. So that means that just a little bit of nitrous oxide in the atmosphere is gonna have a really, really strong warming effect. And now we're ready to talk about the secondary pollutants. Our first set of secondary pollutants are these three uh, interesting forms of sulfur molecules. We've got sulfur trioxide, SO3, sulfate salts, SO4 2 minus, that means it's got a negative two charge on it, and sulfuric acid, H2SO4. These are formed when sulfuric acid combines with oxygen in the atmosphere. So there's actually a step-by-step -step reaction here. Sulf uh, sulfur dioxide combines with oxygen. Remind yourself where the sulfur dioxide came from. Go check your notes. Test yourself. Do you remember what it came from? And these two combine to form sulfur trioxide. Sulfur trioxide will conform with water or will combine with water vapor that's in the atmosphere to form sulfate salts and sulfuric acid. What's the issue? Acid rain and smog. Envir these are both environmental impacts. Uh, sulfuric acid will be precipitated as acid rain or as solid acid particles known as acid deposition. And when these ingredients combine with ammonia and H3, industrial smog will be created. So major impacts of this variety of sulfur containing molecules, acid rain and industrial smog formation. Our next set of secondary pollutants are these nitrogen-containing molecules, nitric acid, HNO3, and nitrate salts, NO3 minus. And they're formed when nitrogen oxides combine with water vapor that's in the atmosphere. Remind yourself where nitrogen oxides come from. Check your notes. And when they're combined with water vapor, they will form nitric acid and nitrate salts. And in terms of impacts, um, acid rain. Nitric acid will be precipitated as acid rain or as solid acid particles called acid deposition. Our 10th pollutant is peroxyacyl nitrate, and it's abbreviated PAN, but that's not a chemical formula, that's just an abbreviation of this name. And it's a secondary pollutant. It's formed when nitrogen oxides and VOCs, those volatile organic chemicals, combine in the atmosphere, uh, and we get the formation of peroxyacyl nitrate and some other oxidants. And we'll talk about those more a little later when we talk about photochemical smog, because this is part of the making of photochemical smog. The issue is that peroxyacyl nitrates and other oxidants are um, highly reactive. They will damage sensitive vegetation. They will actually uh, corrode the leaves of some crop species and some sensitive tree species. And so we might end up with a 
large crop loss. And in terms of human health, peroxyacyl nitrates damage DNA. That's called a mutagen, something that damages DNA as a mutagen. And that can lead to cancer development later down the line. Our 11th pollutant is ozone. Ozone has a chemical formula, O3, which means that there are three oxygen atoms bonded together. And it's formed also as part of the steps of making photochemical smog. Nitrogen oxides combine with sunlight, and that sunlight energy splits apart these atoms so that we get nitrogen and one oxygen atom in nitrogen oxide. And then we get this like random oxygen atom that's not bonded to anything. And that's actually a really big issue. Oxygen does not last long on its own like this. It's super reactive. And so it will very quickly combine with oxygen gas that's in the air to form ozone, O3. Environmentally, ozone is really reactive. It will just corrode stuff. It'll damage textiles, rubber, art-sensitive building materials. It's what's responsible for aging paper and for aging artwork over time. When you see uh, priceless pieces of art contained in, inside a, a box and, and maybe it's a vacuum box and you're like, well, what's the point of that? It's to prevent that material from being exposed to ozone because ozone will damage a lot of those materials. For human health, ozone is a tissue irritant. It will irritate your sensitive tissues, your lung tissues, your eye tissues, anything that it comes into contact with. And so you might be thinking to yourself, wait a sec, I thought ozone was good. We like the ozone layer. You're right. We like the ozone layer because it's really far away from us. It's at the top of the troposphere. What we don't like is what's called tropospheric ozone or ozone in the lower part of the troposphere. Ozone at ground level damages the things around us and damages our delicate tissues. We don't want it down here at ground level. We do want it well preserved up in the ozone layer at the bottom of the stratosphere. Our 12th pollutant is more of a chain of events. Uh, photochemical smog is sort of our 12th pollutant, but it's kind of a complex process. So to generate photochemical smog, we combine VOCs with nitrogen oxides and UV radiation and heat. So think about where these are coming from, VOCs from cars, from paints, from some tree species, nitrogen oxides primarily from vehicle combustion, and then UV radiation and heat. When are we going to feel that? During the summer when it's hot out and when we're getting direct UV radiation that's not at an angle like it is during the winter. And so when these different things combine, we will get the formation of a variety of oxidants like ozone and peroxyacyl nitrates. And so you just wrote those down. Think about what the effects of those oxidants, those very reactive oxygen containing molecules is going to be. But then we also end up with a brownish haze. We're going to get a lot of particles, solid particles that are floating around in the air, and they will reflect light uh, and form this brownish haze. This is photochemical smog. Let me show you what this looks like. Here is our typical brownish smog, our photochemical smog, in three major cities, Los Angeles, Mexico City, and Beijing. And in your notes, I would actually recommend writing down these three places as places where there's a lot of photochemical smog. And it should be understandable why. Photochemical smog forms more, uh, most likely in highly concentrated urban areas. Why? Because there's a lot of cars. Mountain ranges and valleys can exacerbate issues. So think about the location of these different places. Los Angeles is kind of bordered by um, a valley formation and also the Rocky Mountains. Mexico City is also ringed with mountains. And that can exacerbate issues because it prevents the smog, it prevents these uh, particles from easily diffusing and distributing themselves through the atmosphere. Photochemical smog is more prevalent in summer because we need UV radiation and heat for its formation, but cold weather can lead to extremely harmful temperature inversions, which might end up being a more dangerous photochemical smog event. And I'll tell you in a couple slides what a temperature inversion is. Just hold on to that phrase for now. 
Our 13th pollutant is industrial smog. And again, let's talk through the formation of this. Oops, I should have animated this. It would have been cuter. That's okay. We'll go through this formula step by step. So industrial smog is formed when sulfur dioxide, remember from coal combustion, from volcanoes, from smelting, is combined with oxygen from the atmosphere. They combine to make sulfur trioxide. Sulfur trioxide is combined with water vapor to form sulfuric acid. And you might be like, wait, I already wrote this. This was acid rain. Yes, you did already write this. But now the sulfuric acid will combine with ammonia in the atmosphere, and there's naturally a little bit of ammonia in the atmosphere, to form ammonium sulfate, NH4 in parentheses, two. So that means that there are two ammonia ions touching one sulfate ion, this SO4. And ammonium sulfate will form particles in the atmosphere. Uh, it will refract light off of it, and it will form a grayish-brown haze. Here are some examples. Industrial smog is more prevalent in LEDCs with unregulated combustion. So what's releasing the primary pollutants that can lead to industrial smog? A lot of coal combustion. And that's primarily what's responsible for the two industrial smog events you see here. Um, this is a smaller city, roughly in the middle of China, um, that's surrounded by a lot of coal burning power plants. So this is what that grayish industrial smog looks like. This is the Great Smog of London in 1952. This was a unbelievably thick and hazardous smog event. And if you're thinking about London in the middle of the 1900s, you're probably thinking a lot of coal burning. And that's what's driving the smog formation. Nowadays, most MEDCs um, have regulated coal combustion to include some pricey scrubbers that prevent some of the sulfur dioxide from being released. And so we don't see these crazy smog events in London anymore, partially because they've moved away from burning coal and moved toward other cleaner burning fossil fuels, uh, and partially because they've installed sulfur dioxide scrubbers on their coal burning power plants, which are semi-effective. Mountain ranges, valleys, and temperature version, inversions can all exacerbate issues. Anytime we have air trapped around a location, we're going to see more harmful and more significant smog formation, and the smog will just stay there for longer, and it won't dissipate as easily. So let's talk about those temperature inversions. Temperature inversions, sometimes called thermal inversions, happen like this. In a thermal inversion, cold air is trapped below a mass of warm air. So the air and any pollution that's in it stays close to the ground and does not diffuse into the higher atmosphere. Think about how air circulation normally works. It's warmest near the ground because UV radiation hits the ground, is re-emitted as infrared radiation, heat. And so we have all of our heat, our warmest air right here at the ground. And then that warm air rises, it gets cooler. Anything that's in that warm air is rising, rising, rising. And so we constantly have this flow of warm air up off the ground, higher and higher in the atmosphere. And that's good because it means that anything that's released into the air here at ground level is going to be pulled up into the atmosphere and will dissipate more readily. In a thermal inversion event, for some reason, this cold air gets covered with a layer of warm air, or this layer of cold air forms underneath a layer of warm air. This cold air is likely to sink. Cool things sink. Warm things rise. So there's no reason that these two things would mix. And we end up with this cold air being trapped close to the ground and any pollution that's in it is concentrated. And it will stay there for as long as that thermal inversion, thermal inversion event is happening. Causes of a thermal inversion, what causes this, include a quickly moving warm front that comes in and covers cold surface air. So we might have a warm front that moves in and just covers the cold air that's already on at ground level, trapping it at ground level. And also rapid cooling of urban surfaces. So these same surfaces that become extra hot during the day in urban areas, they actually cool off really, really quickly at night. And especially if there's a cold snap, that's come in. So urban areas are more likely to experience these thermal inversions because they cool off so rapidly that we might end up with this layer of cold air trapped underneath a layer of warm air. 
effects are dangerously high air pollutant concentrations because anything that's in this air and continues to be released into this air is not dissipating like it normally would. Decreased photosynthesis. If we have so much pollution in our air that light can't penetrate, our plants will not be able to photosynthesize as well. And increased respiratory irritation, respiratory illness, possibly even death. Areas at risk for thermal inversions, you can probably figure this out, are urban areas with decreased airflow. Uh, so urban areas in a valley, urban areas near a major mountain range, etc. they are more at risk for thermal inversions. Our next section is acid deposition or acid rain. And so I want you to start by just looking back in your notes and reminding yourself, what are the steps to forming those acid compounds, nitric acid and sulfuric acid? What are the primary pollutants that are released? What are the steps to transform those primary pollutants into those acidic things? And here's an interesting fact. All rain is actually slightly acidic because carbon dioxide mixing with the rainwater forms carbonic acid. So a quick reminder when we're thinking about what's acidic, what's basic. Acidic things have more hydrogen ions floating around in them and basic things have fewer. Neutral on our pH scale is seven. If we are below seven, we are acidic. If we are above seven, we are basic. And so that means that all rain will be below seven because it's slightly acidic. But what's officially acid rain or acid deposition is rain with a pH of below 5.5. If it's wet, it's considered acid rain. If it's dry particles of sulfuric acid or nitric acid, that's dry acid deposition. And what's gonna cause that acid rain, same thing that releases those primary pollutants, coal burning that releases sulfuric, uh, sulfur dioxide, vehicle combustion that's releasing those nitrogen oxides. And so just, Remind yourself of what's happening there. This is a, a set of maps that shows actually our success here in the United States with regulating the pollutants that cause acid rain and really seeing a tangible impact in a positive way. In 1994, we can look at the areas of the country that are heavily impacted by acid rain. Most areas of the country, actually anything that's not this nice green value, um, is experiencing some acid rain. The mid-Atlantic is particularly hard hit. By 2008, acid rain levels have really changed. We're experiencing definitely less acid rain countrywide, although the East Coast does still tend to be heavily impacted. You can think about why. Where is our coal, our coal belt? We have a lot of coal mining happening here in Appalachia. We have a lot of coal burning power plants here on the East Coast and air moves west to east across the United States. So any particles that are released are gonna be blown towards the east and we're gonna experience acid rain most significantly on the east coast of the United States, which we do. So what's the deal with acid rain? Why do we care? Well, one thing that's important to note is that you have been outside and experienced acid rain on many occasions. You've felt it on your skin and it didn't burn you. So acid rain is not going to burn your skin. However, it will do other things that will be a little harder to notice. Shallow bodies of water may become acidic, especially if they're low in limestone because limestone um, is, a, is a basic compound, but it will more importantly buffer liquids and prevent them from becoming acidic or basic. If our pH of the water falls too low, we might lose our aquatic life. Most fish cannot survive below a water pH of 4.5. And most crops cannot survive below a soil pH of 5.1. So think about the crop loss that might be felt in areas experiencing uh, heavy acid rain. We can actually look at the map. Take a look here in 1994. Notice all of these regions in the Mid-Atlantic that are experiencing acid rain below 4.5 for sure. We're at like 4.1. I think that's the lowest one I see. Over here in Ohio, Maryland has a 4.3, couple 4.3s. So super acidic rain falling in the 90s. Now it's a little less acidic. We're still in the fours, um, but we're near 4.8, 4.7. There's another thing that happens. When hydrogen atoms are released, and there's a bunch of hydrogen ions in acid rain, 
um, they can actually displace the other ions that are in rock and in the soil and release them. And unfortunately, that releases a bunch of ions that can be toxic to living things. Like aluminum ions are released from rock and will leach into the surface water. This is deadly to many fish. Aluminum ions will cause gill irritation, which will lead to an excessive buildup of mucus, and the fish will actually suffocate to death. So we may see major fish kills, even if our pH in the water is not at 4.5, even if it's at a tolerable pH, just because aluminum ions have been released from soil and rock, have made their way into the surface water, and are ir irritating the gills of fish so significantly. Uh, a low pH will also delicate uh, damage delicate plant structures like leaves and bark. So we might directly see acid rain causing crop loss because it's damaging leaves. It might cause crop loss because it's creating a low soil pH and the roots can't tolerate that. But we're definitely going to see an impact on crop productivity and crop yield some more impacts. Other ions that can be released from rock into the soil include aluminum, lead, cadmium, and mercury. These will all harm roots. And when we have root damage, those roots won't be able to take up water as readily. They won't be able to take up nutrients as readily. And our plants are going to become more susceptible to disease, to drought, to extreme cold. They will die more easily. Our calcium and magnesium ions will also be released from the soil, but this is actually a problem. So calcium and magnesium ions are not toxic. Plants need them. And the problem is that calcium and magnesium ions are already found released in the soil, but when we add a bunch of hydrogen ions into the soil, calcium and magnesium will no longer stay where they are. They won't stay put. They'll actually start leaching downward out of range of plant roots. And so if we're depriving those plants of nutrients, you could definitely predict a decreased growth and decreased yield. Heavy metals, like we mentioned before, including mercury and lead, leached from rocks into soil can move into the groundwater. That can lead to toxic metal accumulation in fish and then in the humans who eat those fish. And Finally, not from an environmental perspective, but from a human infrastructure perspective, limestone and marble structures, buildings, statues are eroded by acid rain. You can actually see some major impacts and some major erosion of many of the monuments in D.C. from the acid rain that falls every time it rains here. Okay, so now we're going to talk about another specific pollutant, lead. Uh, we mentioned lead as one of the possible suspended particulate particles, and we'll talk about this in a slide or two, um, but in 1970, there was an act passed, the Clean Air, Pact, uh, Clean Air Act, that removed lead from almost all gasolines in the United States. And because of that, we can actually see more than just a decrease in air pollution. So we see the amount of lead in the atmosphere uh, in blue. It can cause a decrease in human health issues. For example, in violent crimes. So this is pretty interesting. We didn't see violent crimes uh, decrease immediately after we removed lead from gasoline. We saw it decrease about 23 years later. And that's because once lead is in your body, it will never ever leave your body. And so those people who were exposed to lead in 1970 and earlier, uh, that is a permanent exposure with permanent neurological effects. But people born and growing up after the Clean Air Act was passed have significantly less lead in their bodies. And what we also see is a drop in violent crimes. So lead poisoning is what happens when lead is in your bloodstream and in your body tissues. Lead, again, never breaks down. It has an infinite persistence in the environment and in your body. It will never be broken down into something else, and it will stay in your body forever. You actually cannot clear it from your body. It's a neurotoxin. 
Children and fetuses are especially vulnerable because of their developing nervous systems. So something that's a neurotoxin will damage nerve cells, nerve cells in your brain, nerve cells in your spinal cord, nerve cells in your peripheral nerves that extend out to your limbs and body. Each year, about 14,000 American children under nine years old are treated for acute lead poisoning because remember, children are especially vulnerable. About 200 of those children die, and about 30% of the survivors suffer from long-term neurological issues like palsy, which is a, a shaking limb syndrome, partial paralysis, blindness, and mental retardation. These are all nervous system problems. Where is the lead coming from? Well, it's an air pollution issue. A lot of the lead in the atmosphere around the world is from leaded gasoline. And even though gasoline is uh, lead is banned in gasoline in the United States, it is not banned worldwide. And there are still many countries that are using lead in their gasoline and have high rates of lead pollution in the air. Incinerators and smelters also release a lot of airborne lead. But then we can't talk about lead without talking about the ingested lead uh, components, lead paint, is was commonly used, it is no longer used, um, but old houses with old paint have may have lead in it. And when that paint starts flaking and starts falling onto the ground or onto children's toys or onto dirt, um, that lead can end up being ingested or eaten. Many old pipes are made out of lead. And some ceramics actually have lead in the glazes. So how do we prevent lead poisoning? Well, we phase out or we de-incentivize leaded gasoline worldwide. We phase out or de-incentivize waste incineration and smelting. And then we ban the use of lead in things that are currently using it. There are lead solders to um, attach metal pieces together. There's lead in computers and TV monitors in some ceramic glazes, especially on uh, international ceramics. It's very infrequently used in the United States anymore. There is some lead in jewelry, especially cheap costume jewelry. We should also test uh, everyone's blood for lead by age one to see if there's been an early lead exposure and to figure out what's causing that lead exposure so that we can stop that source before any more impacts are caused. Replace lead pipes and plumbing fixtures that contain lead solder. Remove leaded paint and lead dust from older houses and apartments. Okay, and our final section is how we should improve air pollution in the United States. There's a couple key things that we can do on a large scale and on a personal scale. On a large nationwide scale, uh, we can and we have in the past instituted cap and trade programs for pollution. So that means that we say we put a cap on the amount of sulfur dioxide that can be emitted in the United States every year maybe 300 trillion tons or 300 billion tons. And then we say, all right, well, all the industries in the United States are only allowed to release this much sulfur dioxide. So each company, you are given 100 sulfur dioxide pollution credits. And that means that you can release 100 tons of sulfur dioxide over the year. That's it, you cannot go over that. But if you want to, I don't know, release a little bit more sulfur dioxide than that, and somebody else has some sulfur dioxide credits left over, you could trade for those credits. You could buy their credits, and then you could have a little more sulfur dioxide to release. And if at the end of the year you did an, a really good job and, and you actually had some sulfur dioxide credits left over, you didn't release all that sulfur dioxide, you could sell that to somebody else who wants to emit that sulfur dioxide. That's called a cap and trade program. We could also tax each unit of pollution that's produced on a factory by factory basis. One thing to think about is how hard that is to enforce and measure. Uh, we should absolutely move away from coal-fueled power plants. Think about the pollutants that are released by coal-fueled power plants. We should improve smokestack technology to better remove pollutants from all power plant emissions. We should decrease motor vehicle emissions by improving technology or by reducing motor vehicle use. And we should conserve electricity and eat and produce less meat. All of these things that use less energy will lead to less air pollution. 
Uh, let's re-talk about the Clean Air Act. We mentioned it before in the context of leaded gasoline. This is a law that's been revised a couple of times. The major revisions happened in 1970, 1977, and 1990. And this act established air pollution quality standards for key pollutants, carbon monoxide, nitrogen dioxide, sulfur dioxide, suspended particulate matter, that's what SPM stands for, ozone, and lead. PB is the elemental name for lead. And overall, this has been a real success. Uh, air pollutants have been on a steady decline since 1970 when these standards were enacted. We've seen an 89% decrease in sulfur dioxide emissions from 1990 to today in the course of just 30 years. And the Clean Air Act established emission standards for almost 200 other hazardous air pollutants, especially VOCs, toxic metals, and chlorinated hydrocarbons. The 1990 amendment uh, required reduced sulfur dioxide emissions from power plants. And this in particular has significantly reduced the amount of acid rain in the United States. Okay, here's the last thing I wanna tell you about. When we're talking about improving air quality in the United States, one thing that's currently in effect and is having a major impact in a positive way are catalytic converters. These are devices that are attached to the tailpipe of a car. So the car exhaust will actually flow through this catalytic converter before it exits through the tailpipe. Air flows through the catalytic before, converter before it leaves the tailpipe. And the catalytic converter is designed to reduce nitrogen oxide, carbon monoxide, and excess hydrocarbon emissions. It does it through some pretty interesting redox, reduction in oxidation reactions. Uh, it does contain some very expensive metals. The way that you reduce nitrogen oxides and carbon monoxides and excess hydrocarbon emissions is by exposing those things to these catalysts, platinum, palladium, and rhodium. So there's a bunch of platinum, palladium, and rhodium in these catalytic converters. And for that reason, catalytic converters are frequently stolen off of cars. You can see the underside of the car here with the catalytic converter exposed. It is not uncommon for there to be catalytic converter thefts in neighborhoods where people try to resell the precious metals that are inside the catalytic converter. These are now required on all vehicles after 1975, and they're very efficient. They're about 90% efficient, so we're still going to release some of these pollutants, but they have significantly reduced all of these emissions um, now that they're... We humans in MEDCs spend about 95% of our time indoors, which means that the quality of the air in our indoor spaces is particularly impactful on our health. Our indoor air pollutants are pollutants that tend to build up inside of our dwellings and buildings, and they would be considered outdoor air pollutants too, but they're just not found in high enough concentrations outside the walls of a building. So let's talk about what we're concerned about in indoor air. You're going to set up a table to help you stay organized, a little five column chart. Use half a page or even a full page if you write on the larger side for this. Your first column will be the pollutant. We're going to cover five in detail. Is it a primary or a secondary pollutant? You know what that means. What is its source? What are the human health effects of this pollutant? And how do we mitigate those effects? How do we lessen those effects? The first pollutant that we're concerned with is radon. Radon is a primary air pollutant and it comes from rocks. It is naturally occurring in rocks and it's made as uranium decays, as the uranium atom falls apart. It releases some neutrons and it also release, releases radon, which is a completely different element. Radon is colorless. It is odorless. You would never know that you are inhaling it. You are more likely to inhale radon if you are in a building that is on top of rock that's rich in uranium. So this map that shows risk for radon exposure is actually just showing which areas of the United States have rock that is higher in uranium and thus are more likely to produ be producing radon gas as the uranium decays. So the human health effects of Radon are similar to the human health effects of uranium. Radon is radioactive, as uranium is as well. And if you are inhaling a radioactive substance, that is likely to lead to lung cancer. 
In terms of mitigation, we need to increase ventilation so that that radon gas that we can't see, we can't detect, we can't smell, is swept out of our air spaces and out into the outdoors. The area of buildings that are most at risk for radon exposure are the basements or the lowest floors of the building. And that's because if radon is coming from rocks, it's coming from the ground, that means that the area of the building touching the ground or closest to the ground is the area where we are concerned with radon being released into and building up. Higher floors of a building are not at risk for radon exposure. Draw a line underneath radon. Our second pollutant is asbestos. It is also a rock. It's a primary air pollutant. And the source uh, is, so this is a mineral, and we used asbestos to build insulation, to build tiles, to make lots of different building materials. And I say used in the past tense because asbestos is actually banned. In the 1980s, asbestos was banned as a building material after health effects were discovered. And although we are no longer adding new products to our buildings that contain asbestos, many of our buildings were built before the 1980s or in the early 1980s, which means that it's constantly a game of catch up. Can we find and remove all of the asbestos containing material that's still around in our households today? This is what asbestos looks like. On the left, you can see a rock with asbestos fibers. Asbestos is not the rocky part, it's the fibrous part, which is kind of wild. I bet you've never seen a rock that looks like this, looks like fibers. So we can take those fibers, we can actually turn them into threads and make fabric out of it. We can compress them into tiles, we can use it as insulation, and we did for many years. It's got great thermal properties. But those fibers are really, really small. And because it's a rock, those fibers are actually sharp and pointy, even if you don't sense that when you touch it with your fingers. So if asbestos particles are inhaled, the small particles will stick in the lungs, and I want you to imagine them as tiny needles. They will permanently stick in the lungs, and they will permanently be little needles causing damage. There's a specific lung disease called mesothelioma that is caused by asbestos inhalation, but that constant damage over and over and over can also induce mutations, inflammation as your body tries to clear that damage, induces more mutations, and you can end up with lung cancer as well. Even though asbestos is not radioactive and is not technically a carcinogen, it can cause so much lung damage that lung cancer is a result. How do we mitigate the effects of asbestos? We have got to get it out of all of our buildings, replace all materials containing asbestos. You should not do this yourself. You are not qualified to remove asbestos containing tile, for example. You want this to be done by a licensed professional. They will be wearing a respirator so that they do not accidentally inhale any of the small particles and cause lung damage to themselves. Our next pollutant is mold. Mold is also a primary air pollutant, and it is caused as fungi grow in warm, wet, poorly ventilated spaces. I'm sure you've seen some biofilm, some mold growth in some of your spaces, maybe your bathroom. That would be the warmest, wettest area of your dwelling. Uh, mold inhalation can cause a variety of effects from sick building syndrome to specific allergic reactions, if you are allergic to the mold strain, to asthma. How do we deal with this? increase ventilation. If we increase ventilation and increase airflow, rooms are likely to dry out faster. We should also fix leaky pipes. If there's a water source, like a leaking pipe, that's keeping a wall or an area of the house wet constantly. We want to remove all sources of standing water, constant wetness, and increase the drying speed of all of our house areas. And our final air pollutant is formaldehyde. This is also a primary air pollutant. And it's found in a ton of materials that are used to build the things in all of our rooms. It's found in stain repellents, in wood coatings to make them waterproof, in synthetic building materials like plastic and wood composites. If you have anything in your house from Ikea, that would be a wood composite. It's not solid wood. It's a bunch of wood pieces that have been basically glued together in adhesives in carpeting, in upholstery. Think about the glue that's used to stick the fabric of an upholstered couch to the wood frame that's underneath it. All of those different synthetic uh, building materials, those are likely to contain formaldehyde unless they're labeled otherwise. And the formaldehyde is a volatile organic compound, a VOC. Go ahead and add VOC underneath formaldehyde. It's an example of one. Inhalation of formaldehyde can lead to headaches, 
dizziness, nausea. These are all of the symptoms of sick building syndrome. How do we deal with this? Increase ventilation and also decrease the use of synthetic materials that will be introducing formaldehyde into our buildings. So there are some other indoor air pollutants. There's plenty of things we can put into our houses. If you can smell it, you are inhaling those particles. Fragrances are considered indoor air pollutants, especially if you're using them in high quantities. Bacteria can be indoor air pollutants if they go airborne, so can viruses. Carbon monoxide you already learned about can be released from incomplete combustion and inside our houses it can build up to uh, toxic levels. Dust, that would just be particulate matter. Dust mites, nitrogen oxides from natural gas stoves and furnaces, you learned about those as outdoor air pollutants, but if you're using a natural gas stove or furnace, that's an indoor air pollutant too. Secondhand smoke, lots of assorted toxic chemicals from cleaning products. In yellow, the key for basically all of our indoor air pollutants is just ventilate your spaces. If you're keeping your spaces ventilated, things will dry faster, there will be lots of airflow, and our indoor air pollutants will be dispersed so quickly that they won't build up to harmful levels. Okay, that's our little addition of indoor air pollutants to your air pollution lecture. Enjoy and open a window.